Shalom and welcome. I'm Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt, chairman of the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition, and it's my pleasure to invite you to today's webinar, which is sponsored by the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition, um, with our special guests, Alan Dershowitz and Natan Sharansky. The Zionist Rabbinic Coalition is a coalition of several hundred rabbis who care deeply about Jewish unity and the state of Israel, and who are united in our common goal of engaging constructively with Israel and to work to close whatever gap there may be between Israel and the Jews of the diaspora. We've sponsored a number of webinars and programs such as this one with important and leading Israeli and American thought leaders, journalists, members of various political parties and think tanks, individuals such as Times of Israel editor David Horowitz, Inat Wilf, President Isaac Herzog, uh, Michael Makovsky, uh, uh, Yossi Klein Halevi, Michael Oren, Ministers of Diaspora Affairs, and others. So I invite you to learn more about our goals, our missions, our programs by going to our website, which is zionistrabbis.org. We invite rabbis who are on this call who are not yet part of our movement to please join, and you're welcome to go to our website also. And finally, for those guests who are here who are not rabbis, please, we encourage you to help to support our work, um, which can also be done by going to our web website and learning more about our goals. One last announcement to share with you before introducing our speakers and our program. I want to call attention to the second annual seminar that we will be holding in Washington, D.C., August 14 to 16, where our theme will be why pro-Israel advocacy is more difficult and more important than ever. Please come and join us for that. We'll be sending out information to register in the coming week. It'll be on our website. For those rabbis and colleagues who are listening and who are participating, you may have fond memories of APAC's annual Summer High Holiday Sermon Conference in Washington. Well, since they're not holding that anymore, we're happy to fill that vacuum. Um, and we hope that many of you will join us for what promises to be another outstanding program. Take a look at our website and see what we did last year. So we present today's program at a most auspicious time. I believe I can say with certainty and confidence that anyone and just about everyone on today's call is aware of much of what is going on in Israel today. But we may not all be aware of the nuances, the subtleties of what has happened. And I can safely say I think that we all share a common concern for what we're reading about in the press as we see a country that seems to be on edge with this great division and polarization. So we're here today to learn more, to better understand what's behind what is going on, what's at stake, and then discuss how American rabbis and Jews living in the diaspora should respond. Our guest, first, Natan Sharansky, leader of the Soviet Jewry movement, whose courageous leadership inspired Jews and others around freedom and human rights activists around the world. He went on to become the author of several important books, all of which I highly recommend, and to serve in the Israeli Knesset in two governments and as head of the Jewish agency. Natan, whom I've known for many years, has one of the brightest minds whose analysis and advice is sought by leaders the world over from all persuasions because his insights and the power of his intellect, which is matched only by his moral courage, which is why he's received the Congressional Gold Medal and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Alan Dershowitz is probably the most famous lawyer in the United States. Blessed with a sharp, brilliant analytical mind, he's taught at Harvard Law School and has taken on a number of high profile cases. He's been an attorney and advocate for individuals and causes without regard for how popular or unpopular they may have seemed to be at the time, motivated primarily by principle. On top of all of this, as of yesterday, he's the author of 50 books. Now, I say as of yesterday because he's so prolific, he might have written a new book between yesterday and today. I'm not sure. Uh, but his most recent book is called The Price of Principle, Why Integrity is Worth the Consequences. So I've invited these two brilliant individuals on relatively short notice because they've been intimately involved in these issues. They both have recently penned columns um, and have each independently been working behind the scenes, discussing with some of the principals in Israel what is going on, trying to find a solution, and we're going to hear from them about that. So thanks to both of you for joining us, and thank you for those who are listening in. Today's conversation is being recorded. It'll be available on our website, and we'll be sending it out as well, hopefully within the next 24 hours. So with that, we're going to start. So much is going on, I'm not even sure where to begin. Seth Fransman uh, wrote in the, uh, the Jerusalem Post yesterday or today, he wrote the following. The last several days have made Israel appear increasingly chaotic. Massive protests against judicial reforms on Wednesday came amid comments by the government and opposition that show the country is deeply divided. 
The rhetoric is increasing on both sides. And at the same time, there have been more and more shooting attacks in the West Bank and concerns about revenge attacks by settlers after the rampage in Hurara. I read the article by uh, uh, your uh, daughter in the time talking about her uh, journey on that road and how scary that was. So let me start by asking you, Natan, you're in Israel right now. Is this an accurate assessment of what's happening and the mood in Israel? Please, if you'll unmute yourself. Uh, first of all, thank you, Stuart, uh, for your initiative and for all what you're doing uh, uh, with this organization of uh, of the Zionist rabbis, and I think it's extremely important. Second, I want to say that Alan, together with Irwin Kotler, was my lawyer when I was in prison. I didn't know, I didn't know him, I didn't know that he's my lawyer, but yes, yeah, so we have a long, many years relations, even which started before I knew him. Uh, and uh, so as to the situation, uh, is there reason to be Concerned, yes, I really don't remember this level of uh, division or mm, uh, intolerance of one side to the other. Uh, but one of the victims of all this is the word democracy, because there is so much talk about the end of democracy uh, in Israel. Uh, just to, uh, now I saw a funny clip when children of the kindergarten at the age of five are taught to, to march and to say democracy, 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 that democracy is in danger. Uh, Israel is and will remain democratic state with a very developed civil society, even if this reform will be implemented fully. I do hope it will not because I do have serious uh, reservations and I don't think that if we went too far in uh, building the power of the Supreme Court, it doesn't mean that we have to go to the opposite extreme and to go so quickly without any patience. So both sides have their part of responsibility for the fact that things went so far in confrontation. Uh, but at the same time, I do believe that then there is simply no other way out but to uh, reach the compromise the question is whether it will happen in the week or in a month, and that's very important. Difference. So Alan has also written saying, uh, contrary to a, a relatively famous uh, but often incorrect New York Times columnist, uh, that it's not the end of democracy, nor is it the end of Israel as we know it. But Alan, can I go to you now and just explain to us, how do we get here? In other words, um, is it not true that there have been calls for judicial reform from all sides for sometimes preceding uh, the, the current efforts? In other words, uh, help us understand why you know there are those who are calling for it? Why there are those who are opposed to it? And you know, uh, uh, and we'll get to to what there might be a a, a solution afterwards. But um, maybe we start be explaining the the Barack Justice Barack Revolution of 1995. Well, let me make two points first. Uh, first, this is not about democracy. Israel, as Natan says, will continue to be democracy. Indeed, there's a contradiction always between judicial review and democracy. Democracy is the power of the majority, and judicial review is the rights of the minority. Um, uh, when I was privileged to represent uh, Natan, uh, who was in a Soviet prison, uh, maybe the majority wanted him to be in the prison in the Soviet Union. Of course, they didn't have a voice, but uh, he was entitled to have due process, not as a result of a vote by the majority, but as a result of a basic, basic judicial concept. So that's number one. Number two, it's not about democracy. Number two, it's not even about judicial reform. Judicial reform is a technical issue that we lawyers have been debating for uh, since 1990. Uh, I've been involved in many such debates. Nobody cared. Um, nobody cared when American left wanted to pack the Supreme Court after the Dobbs decision overruled um, uh, Roe versus Wade. The judicial reform is a surrogate for opposition to the Netanyahu government. Uh, this is uh, the left playing Donald Trump. Uh, this was left in Israel saying the election was illegitimate. We're going to undo it. Uh, we're going to have new elections, and we're going to use the vehicle of judicial reform to try to uh, attack the Netanyahu government, Ben Gavir, uh, Smetrich, uh, and you know, I myself, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of the uh, right wing government, but I believe Israel is is a democracy. So, and will remain a democracy. So, I propose a 
compromise. And my compromise, uh, since this is a group of rabbis, will be very familiar to you. My bar mitzvah sedra was shoftim. And there are two famous phrases, one more famous than the other, and those are the two that I would use as the basis for a compromise. Uh, one, of course, we all know, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, that is, you must pursue actively justice, actively, which is the case for activism. People mistranslate the word tirdof as pursue. No, it's actively chase, run after. The struggle for justice never stays won. The other one, which even some rabbis aren't aware of, is uh, Hashem's instruction to judges. Uh, he tells them two things. One, don't take bribes. That's obvious. But that's second. The first one is lo takir panim, do not recognize faces. Do justice blindly. No faces, no races, no political parties. And those are the two bases for a compromise. Number one, whatever else the override might include, judicial override, it should not include basic issues of justice. That is issues of human rights, basic dignity, free speech, due process, equal protection. Those should be the last words of the Supreme Court. Uh, if you want to have override on who can be a minister, that's fine. That's a political issue. Whether the gas deal with Lebanon is valid, that's a political issue. As long as you reserve the core principles of justice and say minority rights must prevail over majority power, I'm okay with a compromise on everything else. The same is true of how judges are selected. You want to eliminate the veto of justices, that's okay. You want to make sure that some political input uh, occurs, that's okay. Just do not ever allow a majority of the selection group to be politicians, to be members of the government or members of the Knesset, because then you'll turn the Supreme Court into a partisan institution which will recognize faces and parties. So lo takir ponim, sedek sedek dof, buy into both of those biblical precepts, and I think we're on the road to an appropriate compromise. So I know you've had conversations, but let me go to Natan, because I know, Natan, you've spoken with a number of individuals. You also just wrote an article uh, about uh, what you just said, that it's not the end of democracy. Could you comment in terms of, you know, the, the possibility of there being uh, uh, some, you know, uh, a need for re judicial reform? And whether or not it's it's too much, you know, Alan has has, has said a couple of rabbinic uh, sayings. I, I very much what comes to my mind is tafasta harbelo tafasta klum. You grab too much, you wind up without anything. Do we have a little bit of that going on? That's all. Yeah, right. Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, uh, I recently wrote uh, or gave an interview, and though I was approaching it not as a lawyer because I am not, and I don't understand many words which are used in these days, but as a human rights activist. And surprisingly, not surprisingly, my conclusions were exactly what Alan said. These are two things which I'm very concerned. If if uh, any decision of the court can be overridden by Knesset, who will defend the basic freedoms? And that's why I think that in the question of free, uh, human rights, the last word has to be to the court. And second, of course, uh, uh, there is kind of veto which judges can put, it's wrong, but also to give the coalition, uh, not the politicians, but to the coalition, all the power, it will also be wrong. But as to uh, uh, station in Israel, you know, each time when I'm speaking exactly about these points publicly, I'm approached uh, uh, by both sides, who or some representatives of both sides, not all the representatives, who both say that they agree with it. So I really believe that the moment the sides will sit and discuss, uh, you'll find very little disagreement. But what I... happens, we have an unbelievable polarization. And I think I know the reason. The reason is that in the last three or four years, we had so many parties during all our history. And suddenly, all of, our, all of them are united in two parties, Rak Lo Bibi and Rak Bibi. Only not Bibi, only Bibi. And, and for three years, that was the, the fight between two parties. Now that uh, there is no way that they, these two blocks will make a unity government. And as a result, uh, it becomes zero sum game. The right. government, even though I do know that th uh, there are a lot of forces who are ready for compromise, but those who are leading this process want to get quickly everything. 
On the other hand, opposition, and, uh, which succeeded to bring hundreds of thousands of people to the street with the slogan, that is the end of democracy, they want to reach quickly the canceling of elections. Let's have new elections. So, uh, and that's why it is so difficult through this extreme uh, shouting to, to make people to sit and discuss. But as I say, from my, from what I hear, each time when I publish another interview, I hear from both sides of the record conversations that they fully accept the need of this type of compromise. I, I agree. And, you know, um, I'm going to be a pessimist here. You know, in Israel, they say uh, a, a pessimist is somebody who says things can't get any worse. And an optimist says, yes, they can. Um, <laughs> things can get much, much worse. I don't believe we're going to have a compromise uh, anytime soon. Why? because both extremes are benefiting from this disruption. The left was dead in Israel. They couldn't even get uh, uh, seats in the Knesset. They just lost everything. Uh, there was nothing left of the left. Now, as the result of this, the left is strong again. They can bring out hundreds of thousands of people on the program of get Bibi, no more Bibi, new elections. Um, the right, the extreme right, the Ben Gavir, Smutridge, 11 group, they have strengthened their view. So both extremes benefit from this disruption. The only two groups that don't benefit are the state of Israel, which is hurt deeply, and the majority of Israelis that favor a compromise. But the extremists generally win. It's happening in the United States as well. We are becoming a country of extremes. So the key role can be played by people like the president of Israel, uh, Bougie Herzog, who's a wonderful, wonderful man, and a centrist, and a man who uh, shows extremes, and by people like Natan, who are admired and loved by people on all sides of the political spectrum. I don't include myself in that category, but I offer myself as somebody who has close friends on both sides. My two oldest friends in Israel, my two oldest friends are Aharon Barak, who I met in 1966, and Benjamin Netanyahu, who I met in 1970. Uh, so I have friends and enemies, but friends on both sides of the issue. And I think that uh, people have to start listening to people like Natan and to people like Bougie Herzog and perhaps the people like me who are offering compromises. But right now, no one's in the mood to compromise. Both sides are blaming the others. Um, I've seen articles on both sides saying the other side won't compromise. But the left, who I generally support, has said, no, we won't down. Gon said it yesterday. We won't come to the president's house and sit down unless they first suspend any action on the bill. And the BB Levin side says, we want to sit down unconditionally. Welcome to the president's house. Let's sit down and, and negotiate. And I think the reason that each side is mostly the left right now is placing barriers is because they really don't want compromise. And I have to tell you, I'm against most of these judicial reforms, but I'm even more against how the left has used these judicial reforms to try to destroy Israel. Uh, they have become facilitators of Israel's enemies. They have become allies with people like Tom Friedman, who was, who was glorifying the fact that now uh, Israel is in trouble. Uh, I don't know why the world cares so much. This is a domestic issue. Why did President Biden butt into this? Does Israel butt in when there are debates about judicial reform in the United States? Why does Germany care about whether or not there's judicial review? Germany doesn't have judicial review or it has modified judicial review. Very few countries in Europe have judicial review. I want, no I want, country I want to ask about comparing, comparing it to different systems in just a moment. But before we go there, I still think it's important for our uh, uh, audience to understand a little better what is the reason why there are those who are advocating judicial reform? And, and maybe you could just articulate the two or three major points. And then why are the people opposed to it? Accepting what you both have said, that it's not just the demonstrations that are not just about judicial reform. I'll come back to that in a moment. But first, I, I just think, you know, we sure. see the, the hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. And then, you know, so many American Jews and even American Jewish organizations are weighing in, not necessarily fully understanding what's behind what's going on. So we understand the demonstrations may be more political than anything else. We'll come back to that. But but specifically dealing with what is being called for and what um, is being opposed. Well, uh, let me say before the lawyer, because Alan, of course, 
is this specials. But they'll say how the people who are not really sophisticated, like me, how we understand how, what is the mood in the society in those 30 years that I live here, is uh, or the, the last 20 years. Is. The feeling is that from the times of our own Barak, um, who said everything is a fit, everything can be judged by judges. The feeling is that whatever the government decides, whether it's political agreements, whether it is laws about relations between religious and non-religious, whether it is uh, whether the, the, uh, those who don't want to serve because of religious reasons in the army uh, uh, should serve or not, what kind of compromise is rich, that judges can always interfere and say we will not accept. That's, so the first issue is that the Barack said we can roll Yeah, away. we can, uh, and, and he opened it, uh, if before, only if your rights are undermined, you can go to the court. Today, everybody who thinks that somebody's rights are undermined can go straight to the Supreme Court. Again, maybe Alan will correct me, but that's the common feeling. This, the second is that the, he introduced this concept of reasonability, whether it is reasonable to make this decision or not. And at least they say that in no country, the judge, uh, when it is not the question of violation of human rights, and when it is not the question of violation of the law, the judge can say, yes, it's all true, but from my point of view, it's not reasonable. That's why uh, I, uh, I uh, pro prohibit it. Again, whether it's true or not, Alan will say, I'm telling that is the perception of majority of people who believe that it went too far, too much power was taken from the Knesset and given to the judges. That's why. And then the third issue also in regard to how judges are appointed. Yeah, That's well, the third is they say, why we don't have uh, conservative Sephardic judges? Everybody is Ashkenazi, everybody is liberal. It's because in Israel, judges are electing judges or judges have veto who not should be elected. And they are electing ourselves. But that's more professional. Yes, but that's a very important remark too. So that's why I am sure overwhelming majority believes that, believed that reform is needed. Because it came in such a moment of such a strong confrontation, uh, as I said, between the two camps, so uh, uh, the representative of the Reform Minister of Justice decided to do it as fully as they were dreaming about and as quickly as uh, possible. And that's what gave up, justified the anger of the people of the left. But then it turned, unfortunately, and here I agree with Alan, maybe not with the same passion, but I do agree that uh, the word democracy became the victim, and not, not this not time, not from our enemies, but from our uh, democratically elected leaders. We hear that we are becoming uh, like Russia or other dictatorship. I have just now was arguing with one very respectable journalist who wanted me to say on record that Israel will become Russia. And they're saying, You don't understand what's Russia, you don't understand what the dictatorship is. There is no way that. Israel has, will have free elections, Israel will have free press, Israel will have independent courts of the, also after this reform. But unfortunately, it, uh, in this passion of the struggle, it becomes lost. So Alan, you talked about the, the, the reasons for reform and then you know what, what you think about the proposals in terms of that they may have been a bit excessive. Yes. First of all, best evidence that Israel will never become Russia or Poland or Hungary are these demonstrations. Uh, it's democracy. <laughs> yeah. uh, second, I agree that my friend Aaron Barak may have gone a little bit too far. I think he should never have used the term judicial revolution. Revolution sounds like it's something in which the law was uh, <coughs> not, not obeyed. It was a judicial evolution. But let's remember that uh, how the Book of Ruth began. Do you remember how the Book of Ruth begins? In the days when judges ruled the land, there was famine. There was famine. Maybe that was a warning from Hashem. Too much judicial power does not lead to good things. So I'm in favor of curtailing judicial power in exactly the way that Natan 
suggested. I do not believe that a court should have the power to say what's reasonable or even what's extremely unreasonable. I don't think court should have the power to tell uh, Derry that he can't run. I don't think court should have the power to say that Benjamin Netanyahu is not qualified to be prime minister. Those are legislative decisions to be made by the Knesset. But if Ben Gavir were to get his way and there would be different rules of engagement saying you can shoot more quickly at a rock thrower who is Arab than a rock thrower who is Jew, that would be a core violation of every concept of tzedek. And yeah. a court should have the power to say, no, you cannot discriminate based on religion, based on ethnicity, based on gender. Hypothetically, what if we get a Haredi government that says women should stay in the home and should not be admitted to universities? Of course, the Supreme Court should strike that down. And of course, the Knesset should not be able to uh, uh, override those kinds of uh, decisions. And especially uh, not by a vote of 61, right? Even by any vote. If you're going to have a vote, it should be 80 percent. And on the issue of standing, yesterday, the Supreme Court of the United States had a big argument about the debt the debt, the student debt. And the big issue in the case was whether or not the people bringing the lawsuit had standing, had standing to bring the lawsuit. And the Supreme Court may very well decide that case on the basis of lack of standing. And so that's a big issue. And again, I disagree with my dear friend, Aaron, who again, I've known since 1966. We taught together, we learned together. I do think that courts should require some type of standing before people can bring a case or controversy before the Supreme Court. So I'd be prepared to sit down with, uh, with uh, Barack, with Netanyahu, with all those folks and try to sort out these things and try to say yes on this, no on this, and quote the rabbinical statement, as you said, essentially is the perfect is the enemy of the good. Nobody is looking for perfect here. What people want is the best possible balance between majority power and minority rights. We're not there right now, but we can get there if we just are prepared to sit down without preconditions. And I want to send a message to my friends on the left today. Do not create preconditions. Go to the president's house without preconditions. Sit down and negotiate. I want to send a message to my friends on the right. Do not demand everything. Be prepared to sit down. When I had my hour or two hours with Bibi in my last trip with Israel, we've known each other forever. He used the word balance five times in the discussion. He said, what we need here is balance, balance, balance. And that's what we all need. And so I think Bibi himself, by his history, his support for the judiciary over the years is inclined toward compromise. But today, the pressure from his right wing is extreme as well. So the extremists today are shouting out the reasonable, moderate people who are a vast majority of who Israelis are. So let me ask this question. One of the things that, that people that is bantered around, and, and either throw it up open to either one of you, some people uh, are, are saying that maybe this is really all about uh, uh, Bibi's uh, court case and as a way of trying to make sure that he doesn't get indicted or so. A court case, which, by the way, which has been going on now into uh, its fourth year, three and a half years or so. Um, and, and so one of the questions is, do, do either of you think that that may be part of what's motivating the um, uh, call for judicial reform? Well, definitely, it's a factor. I can tell you, I was one of Bibi's advisors. Um, I have made strong statements against his prosecution. I don't think that what he did in accepting it was foolish, but what he did in accepting cigars and um, and uh, champagne constitutes a crime under Israeli law. Nor do I think that his uh, negotiations or discussions with media about getting less negative treatment are, are violations of law. But I don't think that the, the effect is direct. I think what happened is this. Because he's under indictment, Gantz won't sit with him in a government. And others on the left, there could have been a national unity government here very easily. And I think the mistake of indicting him and the mistake of not allowing him to negotiate a plea to a reasonable misdemeanor with a fine which is not moral turpitude, is what has caused Bibi to have to go to the extreme right to form his government. So yes, I do think that indirectly, the fact that he's under indictment is a cause of this problem. But I do not believe for one moment that Bibi is doing this in order to help his own case, because I don't see how it helps his own case. His case is now pending before judges who were appointed a long time ago. 
Natan, do you yeah, think well, this has anything? I, I, I can add on to that. First of all, the demand for reform started long, long, long before uh, this case. Uh, I remember at least 20 years of sure. uh, right-wing agenda, and finally they can Im implement. That's what. Second, uh, look, uh, let's say that, uh, uh, that somebody uh, thought that it can help Bibi by bringing more conservative uh, judge to the Supreme Court. So let's say that this uh, case will continue for another three years. How many judges on Supreme Court you can bring during this uh, years? Uh, three, four, I think less probably. Less. So how it can really change the case of the Supreme Court against me? But So I don't believe uh, that uh, it's motiv that all this reform is motivated uh, by his uh, trial. Uh, look, but without discussing whether he's guilty or not, for this there is uh, there is uh, there are judges to decide. Yeah. So let me ask you this: going back to one of the points that Alan had made, because uh, again, there are many rabbis on this call and and also uh, uh, friends and supporters of Israel, and this question about. Um, what should our role be in, in this? In other words, um, as one of the uh, uh, individuals uh, wrote to me, a question about whether or not to, you know this is uh, some of what's being proposed is consistent or inconsistent with Jewish tradition. Um, is it consistent or inconsistent with uh, uh, the perception of it being a, a democracy? Um, certainly, that's what's being you know put out there. Um, and so, again, I want to move to a little bit about you know. Our, um, what should what should be a response within the context of the American Jewish community? And I'm going to throw a curve on this. Is there anyone which we're being used or played? Oh uh, yeah, tell us. Tell us you're, how. You're, no, you're being used by the hard left in Israel. Uh, Tom Friedman is being used. Uh, the uh, the 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 anti-Israel groups are applauding uh, this. And even Abe Foxman, my friend, said his support for Israel is conditional on them not passing this. No, no, my support for Israel is unconditional. No matter what this reform does, whether it goes through or not, Israel will still be among the top 10 democracies in the world. Uh, it will not change the nature of democracy. Let's remember that the vast majority of European countries have parliamentary superiority and there is no judicial review. Um, Israel today has more judicial review than any country in the history of the world. I'll make that as a categorical statement. Second is the United States. And way, way, way after that would be England and other, other uh, countries. So even if all of these judicial reforms were picked, Israel would be much like the United States where judges are appointed by politicians and we get some terrible judges and a terrible process such as that which occurred uh, with Garland and with Bork and uh, with Kavanaugh. Don't, don't borrow our system. Our system is terrible of selecting judges. Having a commission to select judges is far better. We can tinker with the commission at all. But there's no doubt that this is being used as an attack on Israel, particularly by the hard left, particularly by the anti-Zionist left, and particularly by reform rabbis, particularly by reform rabbis, some of the greatest enemies of Israel today speak from the rabbinate, today use their rabbinical pulpit to turn against Israel and to turn against Jewish values, and do not seek to protect yourself by your rabbinical garb. You are the enemies of Israel, and if you're a rabbi or anybody else, uh, if you turn against Israel like that and use this as an excuse to turn against Israel, shame on you. But that's okay. what's going on, and being used and that's why I will not join, although I, I'm opposed to these reforms, I won't any longer join any of these massive demonstrations against them or arguments that, oh, let me give you one more argument and then we'll turn it to Natan. This idiotic argument that if these judicial reforms are passed, it will hurt Israel's economy. That is such nonsense. It will only hurt Israel's economy is if people who say it will hurt Israel's economy create self-fulfilling prophecies. What profit-driven high-tech company would ever leave Israel because of judicial reforms that don't have any impact on it at all? It's a way of using anti-Israel economic pressure to extort uh, results. And it, you know, again, it's just not true. There are some people, some companies that are leaving Israel, not because of the inherent economic situation, but because they believe that if so many people say it's going to hurt Israel economically, 
these self-fulfilling prophecies may occur. So this is extremely destructive conduct from both sides, the extreme left and the extreme right. And I stand and Atan stands and Bushi Herzog stands. I think we stand for the middle, the vast majority of people in Israel who want to see Israel remain high tech, remain startup nation, remain the most vibrant democracy in the Middle East and one of the most vibrant democracies. Let, let, let me go to and and then Alan, I'm going to come back well, to some of the comments. Well, right, well, yeah. uh, I like your passion. You see, I, uh, uh, you see it a lot in the streets in these days, but to hear it from such a respectable law, it's very interesting. But still, I though I don't like the word politically correct, but I think you have to be a little bit more politically correct attacking reformed rabbis. Yeah. I can yeah. give you a long list of I very Zionist reformed rabbis. <laughs> no, okay, okay. Now, so now, I want to come back to that, uh, Alan. I, I yeah, might want to walk that back up. No, no. But go ahead, that's on. Yeah, on. we... we uh, I, I think your role is first of all, first of all, to to dismiss this nonsense that that is the end of Israel democracy. Everything what Alan said, I can say as a human rights activist that it's it's very unfortunate. But it's very unfortunate that today these uh, BDS activists in the West can speak about Israel as a, a totalitarian state using the quotes of so many people from Israel. It's unfortunate, but first of all, every, every rabbi has to be equipped to explain why it is not the end of the democracy. But as to Israel, your appeal to Israel must be very clear to both sides, to the left and to the right. By the way, Alan says about extreme left and extreme right, like with anti-Semitism, it's no more extreme left and extreme right, it's mainstream. Uh, anti semites So unfortunately here, we are not speaking about the conflict between extremes. It's not only a conflict between smoothage and, uh, and the merits. That's the conflict which goes uh, in the mainstream of Israel society because of the images which are created. So your message to our government has to be that it is a big problem. You cannot go so quickly and so uncompromisingly with such an important legislation, which all the Jewish people are, feel that it's also about, about the state of Israel, about them. So the message of the God, the message to their position has to be more strong that don't cross the lines between legitimate disagreement and almost anti-Semitic statements. Well, it is this, uh, we, are, we are all this time speaking about 3D principles, how to do, uh, to, to find the difference between anti-Semitism and the legitimate criticism of Israel. Here, uh, we in, inside also, we are crossing all these lines. So yeah, I think you as a Zionist rabbis, as those that nobody in Israel has doubt that the, the interest of Israel is in your hearts, you have to, to appeal both to our government and to our position with the appeal to stop this dangerous rhetorics, by the way, dangerous rhetorics from both sides, and uh, uh, to that this is the compromise which Jewish people need. So I want to get back to, to, to the point, uh, because, uh, Alan, I, I think uh, I, I must uh, take issue with, with the, the characterization of reform rabbis. It is... It's a, I'm talking about ra a particular group called Rabbis for Human say human rights. I call it rabbis for human wrongs. Um, these are rabbis uh, who never have anything positive to say about Israel. They use their rabbinic garb to make the argument by ethnic identification. Here's the way the argument goes. If a rabbi thinks that what Israel is doing is genocide, and rabbis have used that term, is uh, ethnic cleansing, is uh, subject to BDS, then it must be right. Shame on rabbis for human so, rights. So, so just to be clear. How this argument to be made. Um, most, I have to tell you, most of these rabbis, you'll pardon me, but most of them are Jewishly ignorant. Uh, they went into the rabbinate for political reasons, not religious or rabbinic reasons. And they use their rabbinic garb uh, as a way of protecting themselves from criticism. Well, they're not getting any protection from me. I'm going after them with the same fervor that I go after the BDS bigots. You can be a bigot and still be a rabbi, and many of them are. 
So, but, but I want to be sure we clarify, we're talking about those who have taken public strong positions that are used to condemn and criticize Israel. Um, no, sometimes- Fine, criticize, delegitimate, to use uh, one of- To delegitimate. Rabbis delegitimate. They use the term apartheid. They use the term genocide. They use the term ethnic cleansing. And their rabbinical garb shouldn't protect them from the same kind of criticism we direct against people who are supporting of the BDS movement. Let me share with you uh, uh, something that in, in a column I wrote in the uh, uh, Times of Israel not too long ago about our obligation. I wrote, American rabbis have an obligation to heed President Herzog's advice and do what mm -hmm. we can to calm the spirits and lower the flames. We Agreed. can best help Israel's democracy by encouraging whichever position we support to recognize and accept the imperative to find a way to solve the current standoff by working for and accepting the president's call to find a compromise, one that will best accommodate the need for reform while preserving judicial independence. Our relationship to Israel should transcend concerns, legitimate as they may be, over proposed changes and reforms, ministerial appointments of individuals not fit for office and other things that may be disturbing. For while all of this is going on, Iran continues its march towards acquiring nuclear capability, Palestinian teenage terrorists attack and kill Jews, and the PA distributes candies to children celebrating the murder of six and eight-year-old children, and Israel sends aid to Turkey and Syria. As President Herzog stated in his efforts to mediate a compromise and to reassure a public that has been rattled, quote, Israeli democracy is long-standing and stable. The world of values of Israeli society is not easy to challenge, end quote. So I conclude by saying we can best help Israel's democracy by ensuring that opposition to policies of the new government not become opposition to Israel, that our commitment not be conditional, that our reactions not lead to distancing from Israel or diminish support from it. I agree. I agree. That's a great statement. Yeah. So, so, so that's part of what we're trying to talk about here is how to, to move the, 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 the ball forward. And, and that's why I was asking before about how it is that sometimes you know, people are being used on all sides for other reasons and other purposes, whether it's as Natan talked about, pro and anti and so on. But one of the things we haven't touched upon, and I, I don't think we can have this conversation without talking about some of the extremist positions that are coming from certain members of the governing coalition. Um, and, and also in terms of what happened, uh, the, the uh, a terrible uh, uh, thing that happened in the Palestinian town of uh, 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 Israeli uh, Arab town of, of Huara. Um, and uh, um, I just, let me go first to Natan, any thoughts you have about both those, uh, you know, whether or not any of these actions are being fueled by um, uh, some of the uh, uh, extremists that, that are currently in the government and, and, you know, your thoughts about what's going on now in that regard. First of all, no doubt that Bibi has the most difficult government which he ever had. Why? Because he was like in the center. He had some partners on the right, some partners on the left. At this moment, he is the left, uh, the left, the leftist politically, and the leftist in terms of state and religion. And it's extremely uncomfortable. And also because of the polarization which happened in the last three years, uh, he, he cannot broaden his coalition and turn to the unity government, which is uh, urgently needed. As a result, he has, almost every day, he has to express publicly his disagreement with one or another minister, but cannot remove him. Of course, what just now Smotrich said, that this Hura has to be whatever, he's burnt or whatever, uh, I think it's good enough to be uh, fired immediately from the government, I think. Uh, and uh, and Bibi is hesitant about it because it will mean the new elections. Uh, and uh, well, there is a number of other uh, statements which uh, are ridiculous or deserve to be condemned. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Bibi has to rule. And, and uh, well, at least until now, he uh, tried to shut up, to to not to let uh, them to cross the the red lines uh, or didn't or if necessary he took the policy of that or another ministry on himself but he cannot run all the ministers he cannot uh, make all the people that he keeps as ministers silent so he is really to decide I, I believe he has to make a major effort uh, to broaden 
the government, for example, this reform is a good thing that you want me to go very far in making serious compromises, uh, join my government. Uh, I think that, that has to be message for the to guns, public, and what is more important behind the scene. Look, so, I, I agree completely. I think part of the responsibility for this lies with my friends, uh, Gantz, not ten, uh, sorry, Bennett, and, uh, and others on the center left. Uh, they should be willing to form a government with Netanyahu, which would allow Netanyahu no longer to be captive in some respects. Any possibility to, of that happening? I think it's unlikely because I think the left has decided they benefit from all the disorder and the turmoil, and maybe they'll get new elections. And but the in new addition to that, don't forget, Gantz, you know, in the last government was kind of like kept out of his rotation and felt that he was... Uh, question. I, I I had a long talk with him about that, but his major issue still remains the fact that he won't sit with a prime minister who is under indictment. And uh, you have to put the interests of Israel above your own interests in being prime minister. And I do think that some of the responsibility for this government falls on the people on the left center who are unwilling to sit down and create a more centrist national unity government. But I don't think that's going to happen. I don't know how long this government is going to last. Um, uh, Netanyahu looked at me and he said to me at some point, Alan, you've known me for 50 years. You know I have my red lines. Um, we will not allow uh, any government to uh, discriminate uh, based on religion or ethnicity or to violate core fundamental values. And I hope and pray that uh, he's able to do that while preserving his his government. If there have to be new elections, well, you know, there have to be new elections. That's what democracy is all about. You know, you want to hear a funny story? I'll just tell you this in a second. I was once asked by Peter Beinhardt, who doesn't agree that Israel has the right to exist. He said to me, Alan, I'm so disappointed in you. You used to be one of my heroes when you supported Israel when it was a left-wing country. Now Israel is a right-wing country. Uh, I can't support it. And I said to him, uh, Peter, there are two people responsible for Israel becoming more to the right. One of them is Yasser Arafat. Everybody agrees with that. By rejecting the peace offer of 2000, 2001, he destroyed Ehud Barak and the, and the peace camp. And I said, and the second is Alan Dershowitz. And everybody is shocked. Said, Why is Alan Dershowitz responsible? And I said, because I played a role, obviously, along with Sharansky and Erwin Kohler, we played a role in bringing 800,000 Russians uh, to Israel. And the immediate impact of that, just the immediate impact, was to push the government slightly more to the right. That has changed now, by the way. And the, the children and grandchildren, as Natan will be able to attest much more than I can, are moving much more to uh, the center. And even you know the, the, the uh, people uh, 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 like the former leader uh, of of uh, of the Russian Russians in Parliament is moving toward uh, is moving toward the center. But in a democracy, the pendulum swings. Uh, in the early days of Israel, it may have been too far left with socialism. Today, it's too far right. Uh, often, it's in the middle. But that's the nature of democracy, and that proves that Israel will always remain a democracy, sensitive to the rights of majorities, and I hope it also remains sensitive to the rights of minorities. Natan, do you think any, there's any possibility um, with all of this, you know, um, fermentation and, and the fact that the ground is unsettled, that maybe there will be um, or there should be a constitution uh, that would be developed uh, at this time? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to add to what Alan said. I believe that such a huge failure of left today, it's almost disappearing before these demonstrations, it's almost disappearing. It's because of the tragic failures of Oslo and disengagement. And right. I was against both the things from the beginning. I believe it's compromised uh, or it's, it has nothing to do with human rights and uh, liberty, as it was said, and uh, it's only encourages terror. So that, that's why and I do hope that uh, the left can come back. I'm not on the left, but I do believe that for the balance in the country, it's very important that both sides are strong. Uh, as uh, 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 what was your yeah, regarding the constitution? Do you think? Uh, that... Yeah, look, it's this, in fact what is interesting now that there is much more attention to this and much more understanding why it is important 
that some of these basic laws will really become a constitution, not the constitution which existed only in the mind of Alan uh, Barak, but the real constitution. I think at this moment, understanding of the society about it is much higher. But mm -hmm. let's not trick ourselves. We had such a problem with the constitution because we built our society from very different groups. And yes, uh, for, uh, for example, for our ultra-religious constitution is a very dangerous word because they believe that, for example, in Judaism, there is built-in uh, different roles for women and men. And they're afraid that the moment it becomes constitution of equal rights, and unfortunately, sometimes our Supreme Court proved it, that then there'll be full prohibition of keeping Jewish tradition, for example, of separating men and women uh, in the public space and so on. So uh, it is not so simple, like simple to say, okay, we have all these basic rights. How you are including all the different understandings of human rights. But that's for the lawyers like, uh, uh, like Alan to decide to solve this problem. I have no doubt that this situation proves to many people that we need uh, that some of our laws will become a constitution. Look, it's very difficult to write a constitution for a 70 year old, 75 year old country. Constitutions are easy to write at the beginning of a country when we don't have the kind of divisions. Today, the separation of church and state, the status of Arabs in a nation state of the Jewish people would make it very difficult to have a constitution. Let's remember, the United States had an illegitimate constitution. The only way we were able to get a constitution was to legitimate slavery for the next 30 years oh and to do some terrible, 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 immoral things. And uh, today, Israel couldn't do that. It couldn't do what America did. American constitution was filled with immoral compromises. And so I think Israel is going to have to learn to live like Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain has a constitution, it's just not written. It's based on tradition and history and case law, but nobody would dream of violating the British constitution. Um, it's, it's, but it's not written. And I think the Israeli constitution is gonna continue to be based on basic laws, tradition, history. But as you say, um, you'll never persuade uh, Haredim that um, women and men, uh, that you'll, they'll say they're equal. But they'll but different roles and different statuses. But you know, in America, we have an equal protection clause, but nobody would dream of applying the equal protection clause to an Orthodox synagogue or to an Orthodox wedding. Uh, in my neighborhood of Borough Park, where I grew up, buses have separate seating for men and women, but they're not public buses, they're private buses. So we've learned in America to accommodate to the very religious, and we do a very good job of it. One of the reasons it's very hard to do in Israel is because we don't have the tradition of separation of synagogue, mosque, and state that we have in the United States. You know, separation of church and state is better for the church even than for the state. It was written by Roger Wilson to protect the church from the state. And one of the reasons more people go to synagogue and more people go to church in America than in Israel and in Europe is because we have separation of church and state. It's a good thing, but I don't think Israel will ever be able to get its act together to create a constitution that deals satisfactorily with that and some other issues. So Alan, you've been uh, relatively harsh on, on, on the left in our conversation here and helping us to understand how it's being used by the left as well as by the right. Um, I wanna give you an opportunity to be an equal opportunity um, <laughs> uh, offender. And uh, if you could maybe just share any thoughts you may have about either the extreme right in the government presently, and as well as about the role of the Haredim in, in, in all that's happening. Did, did you hear my, me, Alan? Oh, I thought it was directed to Natan. Oh, yeah, no, 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 I said I wanted to give you an opportunity. <laughs> no, uh, no, he believes that First I was very weak on the left, so I don't need to prove it by being strong on the right. But you have to prove your equal approach. Right. You can't generalize about Haredim. I have a lot of Haredi friends who are opposed to this judicial reform, uh, who believe very strongly in the rights of, of minorities. So you can't generalize about Haredim, but, but uh, obviously the influence of Haredim is much greater than it was when David Ben-Gurion made his tragic, tragic mistake 
And, and what about the, the, the people like Smotrich and Ben Gavir? How do you think they should be dealt with? Uh, you know, and, and, and dealt with by no but, longer being in government. But uh, that requires, obviously, uh, for there to be other people in the government. Look, remember that Ben Gavir was elected with the help not only of kibbutz members, but of some Arab voters. He ran on a platform of reducing crime. Um, and so he had popular support. It's in the nature of democracy. Look who we have in America. We have a congresswoman like Green on the one side and a congresswoman like Ilan Omer on the other side. Uh, we have terrible, terrible people in our, uh, in our House and Senate. Uh, the difference is that in Israel, as a result of all the things we've talked about, uh, Netanyahu has had to include some of these people uh, in the government. I wish he didn't. I wish that people in the center left would join him and create a government that didn't include extremists on either side. Thank you. I'm going to ask each of you for a closing uh, comment, and then I'm going to wrap things up with a closing comment about the ZRC. So, Natan, where do we go from here? Is there any hope? You know, we talked a little bit earlier about optimism. In so many respects, this is so often the case. Um, the, 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 the path through the middle, the path to compromise is so obvious, and everyone just has to give a little bit. You've had conversations with people. I'll come back to it because I almost yeah, well, thought it was any all, possibility. First of all, not only I'm an optimist, I think that all this uh, 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 shouting uh, about the tragic situation in which we are, about the end of democracy. So it's, uh, it's like this uh, Fukuyama is the end of history. There was no end of history. There is no end of uh, Israeli de democracy. And uh, uh, let's look, uh, look at it a little bit philosophically. Second, I do believe there is practically inevitably there will be compromise. Like Rambam said, you go to one extreme, then you go to the other extreme, then you meet in the center. Uh, the problem is that we went to one extreme during 25 years. We went to the other extreme in two weeks. So now we have, uh, I hope that going to the center will take no more than a few weeks, though uh, uh, other things it's impossible. I do believe from feeling what both sides hope. I believe they they are very much prepared to meet in this in the center. Uh, simply this uh, populist demagogical atmosphere is not helping. But I hope we will overcome it. Thank, thank you, Natan. And then, um, Alan, do you have any uh, uh, thoughts you want to share with us at this time as well as we wrap things up? You're, you're on mute, by the way, Alan. I, I, she may have switched to your iPhone or something, but. Just if you could unmute. There well, we go. You're on mute. Uh, yeah, here's we here's you. my suggestion. My suggestion is that Natan form a committee, uh, which <laughs> this him, he'd be the chairman, and people like Erwin Kotler, people like me, people like Ariel Rachman, the head of the Rachman Institute, people who love Israel and who represent the center, who represent people on neither extreme. And we can become a kind of voice including our rabbi here, a kind of voice for moderation and compromise, because our voice is not being heard. I think one place where, where Natan and I disagree, Natan says that these demonstrations are mainstream. I don't believe that. Even 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, a half a million represent a tiny proportion of the 9 million people in Israel. I think that the 5 million of them are in our camp and favor compromise. And therefore, if you would become the chairman of a committee of compromisers, and we could sit down and have our voice heard too, not screaming and yelling and not going out on the street, but writing op-eds. I have an op-ed coming out in the arts this weekend. I had one in the Jerusalem Post last week. All of us have written, please form this commission, this committee. I will be happy to be your assistant. I'll carry your bag or be co-chairman or something like that but create a commission which could include maybe 100 prominent people who are centrists and who are demanding compromise. Alan, Our, isn't, isn't President Herzog basically offering that uh, compromise position, though? That's right, but he needs support. So let's create this commission to, to support President Herzog and to say, we want compromise. Let's do that now. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody who participated in our call today, especially Natan and Alan for a very, uh, needless to say, lively conversation. Certainly gives us a tremendous amount of food for thought. Um, the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition, I just want to conclude by saying, is committed to making sure that our 
relationship for Israel and with Israel transcends any particular differences that we have. As I've said before, um, we do not love Israel because it is perfect, nor do we need Israel to be perfect for us to love her. And it should be transcend that. And so we're looking for those ways in which, as American rabbis, we can try and help people navigate, understand what's going on, and also help in any way that is possible uh, to bridge that gap. So um, I urge colleagues who are part of this conversation today um, to please take to heart the words that are said here um, to make sure that we are facilitators uh, for compromise and for uh, to try and help to move things towards a positive solution. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. And uh, uh, greatly appreciate our conversation today. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.